Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dam, and today we're going to be talking about the second novel to feature the 13th Doctor, Molten Heart, written by Una McCormack. Um, I've also as well have read, read it, should I say, uh, with the audiobook read by De Dan Starkey, uh, who is most noticeably played Sontarans and most noticeably again for playing Strax, um, with Vaster and Jenny in stories like The Snowmen, um, A Good Man Goes to War, uh, Deep Breath. I can't remember if he appeared after, after that. Uh, so yeah, he, um, he's a big connected Doctor Who star. Um, the 13th Doctor novels, the three trilogy that came out around about the same time as series 11, um, they were all written prior to the casting of the 13th Doctor in terms of the public knowledge. So, um, as it's described uh, during the making of these, the novels were actually written before the Doctor, they even knew that the Doctor was female. All they had to do, all they had upon is the first, or at least a draft of the first episode, A Woman Who Fell to Earth. And it was only... Uh, on the last draft of the books were they allowed to know that the Doctor would be played by Jodie Whittaker. Uh, and so they adjusted the scripts accordingly. Um, the big important thing about these um, novels from the 13th Doctor is that they are very politically heavy. The first one we talked about, The Good Doctor, um, which we, you know, if you want to watch that, I've got the video on here. Um was talking about you know gender roles and stuff in 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 an environment in a civilization uh here it's more to do with climate change um and you know the sort of story deals with that um before i begin a few things first as you probably have noticed i just realized the door's closed <laughs> the setups have changed uh the shed has been moved around the, the the funky shed which I've been using as my uh, base of operations for these videos for a while now has changed a bit so I am moving things around. Do you like this setup? Maybe I'll try and keep it as long as possible. Maybe I'll try new things. Who knows? By the time you watch this is probably like a year after I make these so don't even bother answering the questions. Um, secondly, um, I'll talk about first of all the immersiveness of these because whenever I talk about a book or an audio drama or comic uh, one of the things I get asked the most about these things is is it immersive could you read this or listen to the audio book and picture watching the 13th Doctor era in particularly in this uh, in this case and then I'll talk about, you know, the main story in the novel. And then I will talk about uh, the audio book and whether I, you know, whether I enjoyed uh, the audio book, which is a kind of a new experience for me because as the time I recorded this, this is the second audio book I've ever listened to whilst reading the book. The first one was obviously The, the Good Doctor, which again, you can watch if, you, uh, if you're interested in that. So first of all, immersiveness. Um, can you read this and picture... Jodie Whittaker saying these lines, Mandip Gale, Toshin Cove, Bragley Walsh, and you can picture it in the directing style of the 13th Doctor era. Well, actually, it's actually quite interesting when it comes to this story because um, I can't remember I can't remember where it's from. I read it from the Doctor Who uh, Wikipedia page, the TARDIS wiki, that this story was actually more influenced with the Hartnell era. Uh, the writer, Una... McCork Mac, um, who I just remembered, we've also previously talked about one of her novels for the Time Lord Victorious, a Tenth Doctor novel. I can't remember which one she wrote, but we have talked about her bef uh, work before. Um, she said for this story that she, because she wasn't allowed to know a lot about Series Eleven prior to writing this, she actually based the kind of the 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 wide escape of the story around a Hartnell like narrative as well as being inspired by um the chronicles of narnia where our characters go into a very strange world and they have to hide essentially from the environment who 
finds our main characters strange and odd, but some people are uh, after them and some people are actually befriending with them and that's the, the, the communication. You can kind of, you can see the influence that she talks about uh, quite clearly, I think. But is it immersive enough? Does this story feel like a 13th Doctor story? I'm going to say no. The Doctor is characterised very well here. Um, the Doctor gets a lot of northern elements um, in her way she speaks. And she's like, oh, that's nice, kind of like dialogue. But in terms of what Jodie Whittaker particularly brings to the role and those little elements of the TV series, uh, at least from series 11, that I really do enjoy about her performance as the Doctor, where... She gets these speeches of passion and love and affection for things like, um, like the sci-fi, the technology in the Trandakan conundrum, and a speech about love in the Demons of the Punjab, and um, another example is the story, uh, her speech about the universe in uh, It Takes You Away. But none of that really seeds in here. This story could have really featured any Doctor. There's no really big speeches that really tie it to her Doctor. Rather than it has that northern -y presence in her speech. Um, but apart from that, it could be really any Doctor. Um, Yaz, and, uh, Yaz and Ryan, should I say, in this story, though they do have a very integral part in the story and whether they are actually good within the story is what we're going to talk about when we talk about the narrative um in terms of them being characterized by their tv counterparts never really felt them even being attempted um though ryan does get mentions of certain things that happened in a woman who fell to earth in a few scenes and bradley walsh's graham character you can clearly tell that bradley walsh um, is clearly being thought of. It has that kind of um, that speech. is like um, he tries to like you know be the the normal comedic um, Yorkshire style to the story uh, to his speech, but it's never funny as the way Bragley Walsh would play it. I never, especially when you listen to the audio drama, the audio book. Sorry, uh, do you get? that and that's, a, that's something we'll talk about uh with the audiobook as well which we'll we'll get on to with so anyway the story the what i don't really like it actually at the start of the story is uh the story kind of takes like uh builds up to one narrative first of all you see the doctor and yaz and graham and all that they're, ex they're exploring this new planet which they learn about this this seemingly uninha um uninhabitable uh Habited, sorry, uninhabited, kind of like an okay planet, but something's happening underneath the surface. And what I like about the start of the story is that we first get like this, like a little, little like um, fairy tale, and about how these like a small family of people who have these each family member has these each like kind of of ideas of how the world should work one's like really friendly just tries to get on with everybody uh one person is i can't remember the other one but the third one is like a scientist they want to know how the world works how things function and wants to experiment and wants to maybe understand things for the benefit of everyone else but still has a much more interest in understanding them than the other two and what we slowly learn throughout the story is that that actually plays into the story. The story kind of starts off vague in terms of what the story actually is. Very like fairy tale a lot of, of suggestions of things. But then slowly uh, the story becomes more and more, you know what they're actually talking about. It becomes less and less vague over time. Um, when the Doctor and our crew land underneath the surface, uh, we quickly learn about this civilization of rock people, who I imagine was reading this as the species of Korg from the film Thor Ragnarok, as well as Thor Love and Thunder, but we forget about that. Um, I imagine like that's what they look like, because the story clearly states that they're stone-like people, um, stone aliens, 
and essentially there's this massive cavern underneath the planet and essentially this species they have no idea of the outside universe they've lived their entire lives underneath the surface where many of them believe in that this is all that life is being under the surface but one scientist basalt um, he believed that there is something beyond the the roof of their world and believed about the the surface of the of the fear leaving into some sort of wide empty space not really known about aliens and other planets as of yet but knows that outside of their world outside the inside of the sphere there is a outer even larger bigger world but there's also something happening to this world that is slowly destroying it and Basil went out to investigate and he hasn't been seen since. And it's up to Ash, um, his daughter, who quickly befriends our main, uh, befriends our main characters, uh, to go and find and rescue him. And that's essentially the main plotline of the story. As well as we learn uh, in the city of these rock people that there are few of them that kind of, not worships, but is under the the rule of a woman known as Emerald, who, uh, though at the start, uh, Basalt, he was telling people about his theories and his ideas around uh, what, like, the world is and what outside of it and other things. And first of all, people were fascinated, but later on they felt like they couldn't control anything out of their environment and slowly getting annoyed with him was a lot of people... He was like kind of like banished out of their society. And Emerald does everything in her power to try and silence any sort of Basalt's research. Which hence why he needs to go essentially missing and it's up to our characters to try and find him. Whilst also as this going on, there's these cracks in the sky. These kind of lines of light um, that are appearing. As well as these waterfalls seemingly appearing of salt water which is deadly to this rock species and and it's up to our characters to essentially find out what's happening trying to convince emerald that these things are real are actually happening and it's not because basalt is some sort of traitor trying to do this to control um the diamond city but is in fact it's a part of this seemingly natural progression of the world and it's up to our characters to try and convince Emerald to get off her ass and do something about the story and about the narrative. Now our characters here, they do uh, they do quickly get split up earlier on in the story with the Doctor and Ryan teaming up with the, um, Ash to try and find her father whilst Yaz and Graham, they go with another character called Quarks um, and they try to essentially try to convince everyone else that hey there's a life outside of this world there's a life outside of this environment and we should take like notice of this and also as well we should listen to basalt and you know do something about the environment of our of our city of our world which is slowly getting decayed and destroyed by the effects of seemingly natural phenomenons but we can take effect if we all act together. But it's Emerald who's silencing everybody. Quite similarly to how politicians try to um, downplay the dangers of climate change. Where it is a real terrifying uh, phenomenon which could destroy our planet Earth. And that, like, the what I really like about this story is that it splits our characters in this particular way. As far as series 11 at this time in the series, didn't split the characters these ways. It's usually the Doctor and Yaz, or the Doctor and Graham, but never the Doctor and Ryan, and Graham with Yaz. We never got that really in series 11. We do get that uh, way later down in series 12, um, but much later down in the series. So this is actually a really unique read at this particular point in the series. There's also the world building environment of the story. The story is very great in world building because usually when we go to an outer explored world, people either look like our characters, where they're very humanoid, very 
you know, skin and hair and everything. They look like humans. And they can blend in to a sort. Um, or they, they can't really blend in. But the world kind of is aware of these kind of people. And our characters can kind of just get on with the story. However, in this story, because everyone else is a rock person who doesn't believe anything outside of their environment, seeing our characters just look humanoid is absolutely baffling to them. And some of them find it absolutely astonishing. Like Ash, who, who recognises these people as aliens to them, and she's massively enthralled with them because... They are living proof that Basalt and his theories about the outer world of their planet is right. Although uh, our characters are actually far more uh, alien than they, than they anticipated where they believe that they were from the surface. When, of course, our characters are actually from another planet. And the story does a great job at uh, when they split up the characters from using... The Doctor and Ryan to try and convince um, the other team members when they meet them later on of of being the aliens and stuff and using that to pick up the story and the interests of the of our characters. Whilst on Yaz's and Graham's point of view, it's kind of like a story of prejudice where they're on the run, they're hiding, they've got to keep secret because if Emerald finds out that these people are around. Um, it would basically say that Basalt was right, and so they need. She needs to kind of impress, oppress them, trying to keep them a secret as much as possible because she believes that if people knew that these aliens walk among them, that it will basically cause to chaos, catastrophe, and all that shenanigans. And that is very a well, well structured into the narrative. I also liked how lots of things are described here. Because most of the story, there is no sunlight. But there is this other sort of light where it's like everything's like bouncing off each other. The starlight is coming through through these holes, which kind of looks like the night sky to the unpresuming eye. And all of these things kind of glow in the atmosphere. And it gives the story a really great sense of visual style. In fact, if I have to criticise this novel, is that I feel like this story would have worked better in a much more visual medium. The, the visuals that this story uh, presents us kind of does mean that the story does have to kind of stop to go like, right... Here's how this entire room looks like. Here's are all of these beautiful crystals and the lighting, how it shimmers on the skin of these rock people and the certain technology that these creatures make in. Right? That kind of makes up most of the written word of this. Um, also, in Una um, McCroak Max writing here, a lot of it is greatly visually stunning. However, in terms of dialogue, there's a lot of this character. Uh, character talks, uh, this person said. Another character talks, this person said. It's the, um, the, the criticism of constantly using the word, like, they said, constantly, which kind of does make the dialogue feel a bit stale at some times in terms of re reading it. Um... But yeah, it is It is an issue, I think, with the story. It should have used a lot more expressive words in terms of its dialogue. Like, I think, in terms of how characters talk, they said, they hissed, uh, they whispered, and they shouted are probably, like, the only words that really get used. There might be others which kind of get mentioned more, I uh, mentioned, like, once in the rest of the story as well, but... For the most part, the story relies on this character said, the other character said, when it comes to the dialogue. But when it comes to the description, um, Unama Cromack does a fantastic job here. Very well done, very well executed, and it makes me do kind of disappointed that this story is a novel. I really wish this story could have been a a narrative, a, a story, uh, a TV story, sorry, but, but, or a comic book. I think the story would have worked better as a comic book. Uh, but anyway, um, our main characters 
off, and like I stated at the start of the story, uh, the start of the video, they are portrayed well enough that in story, in the context of story, you get what you need from them as the characters, and they do have their quirks, they do have their 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 character traits, shall I say, with the Doctor having a Northern accent, the Graham having his comedic, down to earth Yorkshire uh, persona. Uh, Yaz does get mentioned about her her cop uh, training, even though that does kind of fall flat in the story. Because even though it does get mentioned and she does try and thing, most of the time that goes really nowhere. Like uh, there's a scene where she think it's her first time meeting Emerald, which actually happens like just after halfway through the now uh, for the novel, and she's like, right. Got to remember that uh, police cop are training and stuff. It's like, okay, this is the stuff I want Yaz to do in the TV series. And then, like, she completely mucks it up in a way which, like, it feels like like very unprofessional for a cop character. I, I don't know if that makes much sense. And even saying it now probably isn't a strong criticism. But I don't know. I was thinking, when I was seeing this playing out, that's what I was thinking. It's like, for a character, one of the few cop companions of the series uh it feels very so very disappointed in that um but in terms of really getting the characters from the tv series into the novel i do feel this story kind of falls flat in that like i said it does like it does have the 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 like if you squint your eyes you can see the characters there but in terms of the nitty and gritty of these characters Nothing really is there, apart from a few scenes with Graham and Ryan uh, mentioning uh, Grace, Graham's wife and Ryan's grandmother. Um, there's a one bit where they Ryan and Yaz, oh no, right, Graham and Yaz, they they hear these things uh, like it's like a secret code which reminds them of wind chimes. And Graham mentions how like that reminds him of Grace, who used to have them. After Yaz is like, I hate wind wind chimes, and then Graham's just like, um, you know, Grace had them, and then he kind of like tries to cheer her up by saying like, actually, I hated them as well. I could never get any sleep with them, but Grace, she could sleep, she could sleep like a queen, um, like that. Those little moments do like when when they directly reference a woman who fell to earth. You of course you get the characters there, but I mean like in terms of the general feel of the characters, they're not really presently there, but they do function well in the story, and you do are interested in these characters. Um, but I think the story where the story shines is its supporting cast. Um, the main one, the main character, essentially is Ash, who is the daughter of the scientist character Basalt, and she just the fact that these cow characters. Uh, the Doctor and her companions exist in this world, exist in this story, um, has just this overwhelming joy that her father is right, and we got to search for father. And she has this kind of sweet, kind of shy personality, which the imagery of this um, sweet, innocent character who is also a giant rock, when I say giant, like a, like a just a slightly above taller than normal humans, uh, rock creature again probably is where I'm getting the Korg uh, imagery in my head who is a very like soft spoken character who's also a rock person um, the characters here are very surprisingly not that violent per se it's a very like narratively focused not like on like action scenes or danger like that I mean, of course, there's danger. It's Doctor Who, and there's the world's about to be destroyed, and there's an oppressive uh, leader authority. But like, nobody like wants to like directly kill anybody. Never, nobody ever wants to like destroy anybody or destroy a civilization or destroy a. Thing. It's more to do with silencing and keeping ideas which they do think could cause harm. Just keep them quiet. Kind of thing, and I do. It's a, it's a refreshing, it's a refreshing taste of form, um, for Doctor Who, but with Yai, Ryan, sorry, Graham and Yaz, they meet a character Quarks, who we learn uh, earlier on is uh, Basil, one of Basil's best friends, but he also 
seems really shady towards the Doctor and Yaz. But, and basically the Doctor tells Yaz, keep one close eye on him. He seems a bit shady. And this is something kind of like a soft-spoken, um, almost posh, upper class about the way he speaks. Um, Dan Starkey in the audiobook gives him a voice which reminds me a lot of the Dam Busters film. Um, I don't know if that was intentional or not. But like, it's, it's, he's just a strange, interesting character because he's he seemingly has these kind of strange reactions to things. Yaz, in particular, takes note of his expressions and takes note of like what he is like what she thinks he's currently thinking in the scene in the environment and some of the certain things he does like um he takes them to his house which he has a secret tunnel straight from the library or the laboratory of of uh, basalt straight to his house and really without giving uh graham and yaz that much of a notice he actually invites a few people um who are basalt's friends in to his house to meet uh, Graham and Yaz to try and convince them that Basalt is is right. But Yaz thinks that he is using this to try and betray them to uh, the Emerald Emerald Empress. So that is a that's really like, you know just a lot of interest in like beats and character quarks there. Um, about two thirds away, we also get introduced to Onyx. A character who is much more basalt loyal, though he didn't really believe him, but he really wanted, really wanted to believe him, and it was up, and it was until he met uh, Graham and Yaz in that meeting, does he like, okay, basalt is right, the world is about to be destroyed, we need to stop um, Emerald now. And that's, you know, that's a lot of, that's really, really interesting. That's really, uh, Onyx is a, just like, the supporting cast here are just so well, like, you just, you just, you just feel like you know these people. Like, I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. I think it's mainly the dialogue, the way they're written. Everybody seems, like, there are always scenes where characters just didn't know these characters. And get a feel for these characters. It's just something... I don't. It's just. I think the story because it, there's not much secondary characters. There's only really two: Ash and Quaz. Basalt really doesn't get into the introducing the story until uh, two thirds in. The uh, same with Onyx. But when we get introduced to them, um, we we know a little bit about Basalt anyway. That his introduction isn't needed when we meet him. And Onyx, though he does get introduced two thirds in the story. The story does leave enough time for us to know him, get to understand where he, his mindset is, and have him have a prominent part in the storyline. And that's what I think really is the core strength of this story. It's not particularly perfect, however. Um, I don't want to give away the ending because a lot of people might be watching this and may have not read this book. Um... But like the story on its it takes like a slightly strange turn um, around about uh, chapter 9, chapter 10 um, where like when our characters finally like reunite um, they kind of come up with these ideas of like how we can fix everything um, and they kind of figure when the thing starts wrapping up when they start realising what's actually going on Things it does feel a bit rushed in that department, and in the final chapter, we get introduced to a, like another character, um, Obalulu, which is just like what a name, what an absolute name. I won't spoil. I won't spoil who he is and what his part in the story is, but like, it's like it just comes out of nowhere, and he kind of feels out of place for the rest of the story, and it's just it just felt really odd. The ending of the story, like I said, the say it, the the dialogue scenes, especially when it comes to like how the, the dialogue has been described. I can't remember the, the 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 official problem, the cliche of poor writing, where it's like this character said, this character said, this character said, this character said, kind of thing. 
Uh, no, that's actually the dialogue said this character. Dialogue said this character. Um, but yeah, so it's not a perfect book. However, there is a lot to really like about this narrative. So anyway, that is the novel. But before we go, let's talk about the audiobook read by Dan Starkey. Now, I think I mentioned this in the Good Doctor audiobook uh, segment as well. But one of the really strange things about trying to get, get this immersive into the series, they don't use the Doctor Who theme. I don't know why, that always puts me off guard when you go into the Doctor Who story with our main character being the Doctor and the Doctor Who theme doesn't play. It doesn't really set in that much. What really actually sets me apart from this, from the good Doctor, is that in this one, the music, the you know, like uh, you have like in the audiobooks, you have music and you have sound effects and stuff like that. There's actually a lot of that in here. There's a lot of moments where it's just Dan Starkey talking and that's it. There's no music. There is music in this, but it's so, like, there's, there's so little of it. I think there's only, like, one song, like, from this, made for this, and then that's about it. Um, but Dan Starkey, he does try and give these characters their voices. He, he does try and do a Jodie Whittaker impression, or uh, Matt Tosh and Cole, Amanda Gill... His Graham impression is horrible. His Bragley Walsh sounds nothing like Bragley Walsh. He just gives him a kind of northern accent, you know, like that. And I don't think it works at all. But my God, he gives it a try. He gives every character a voice. He gives every character a, a, a particular distinct voice. And he has a lot of great, like, fun to read, uh, to read with. He has that, that just a, that quality we can clearly tell he's enjoying reading all this. Um, but like in terms of production, like the music and the sound effect, the only real sound effect is the TARDIS uh, dematerializing. Uh, with we're gonna like one or two songs in the actual whole thing, um, and the only real like sound effects in terms of the voice is when like characters are speaking through a hologram. Their voice kind of has a like robotic um, auto, what's it called? Like a filter over it. Um, but it's up to Dan Starkey. He's just great. I would love to re read more books with Dan Starkey doing the audio uh, book. But maybe not the 13th Doctor because I don't think he really captures these particular particular characters well. Maybe he would be great for a Sontara novel. That's a great idea. Somebody should pitch that. Um, the music in here, like with The Good Doctor, reminds me a lot of early 60s Doctor Who, which again, this story trying to be Hartnell, according to the writer, is really interesting. And you do really get that, like, that uh, first Doctor vibe, which I said about uh, The Good Doctor, but it's not as prominent here, because like I said, the music's not that prominent in this audio book. Um, but you know... Dan Starkey, it's Dan Starkey. He, gi he gives it it all. He doesn't always succeed when it comes to characters that were portrayed in the TV series. But he gives these characters... Maybe what I liked about the character... Maybe I could be blinded why I like these side characters so well. It's because Dan Starkey gives them all a distinct voice. A distinct accent, shall I say. Um, but, yeah. The audiobook. Uh, I recommend the audiobook for the the novel even though i don't think it's as immersive as i think people want from an audiobook um though dan starkey really tries really 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 tries and then for the most part he does exceed he's just trying to get that particular 13th doctor era into the narrative into this story which if that's what you're looking for this theory i think is not for you it doesn't feel like the televised 13th Doctor. Which actually, uh, from a few people, that might actually be what you want. You might not want a, uh, a televised, accurate 13th Doctor story. Who knows? Um, but anyway, that is Molten Heart. I didn't really talk about the political allegories. In this, I was having so much fun talking about the characters and the world building, and I forgot really to talk about like what the story actually is about. 
Um, but I hope you get my, my gist of my feelings for this particular novel. So anyway, that is Molten Heart. So join me next time for the next novel, the last in the 2018 trilogy of novels um, featuring the 13th Doctor. I don't know what it's about. I don't even think I can, I've got the, the title of it properly. Um, so no like description for it. So join me next time for what I believe is called Combat Magic or Combat Mag-Mek? Mamek? Mamics? Something like that. So join me next time for that. And I'll see you next time on The Doctor Who Marathon. Sarah.